So joining me now, my colleagues and hosts of their own shows right here on MSNBC, of course, Chris Jansing, Jose diaz Balart, and Ana Cabrera. Katie Turr was supposed to be here, but she's a little bit under the weather, so we're missing Katie today, but she's going to be back as soon as possible. Anyway, what we've been talking about what the candidates are doing. We know that they're prepping probably Kamala Harris more than you know, Donald Trump. And we know that Joe Biden probably prepped too much and maybe did the wrong kind of prep. So there's a lot of focus on that. The moderators are prepping. I've been a moderator. You know, we'll talk, Jose, you, your experiences. But when I was moderating a debate or more of those debates, we spent two weeks on MSNBC uh, going through, you know, questions, possible questions, fact checking, research, questioning each other, possible responses, you know, all of that honing it all down, figuring out the timing. So that's a big challenge. Uh, one of the toughest debates I was ever in was back in 1988 when George H.W. Bush, the incumbent, did not agree to a debate with challenger Michael Dukakis until the day before, and they scheduled it for L.A. So we were red-eyeing out, and that was the tactic, and that was you know, the last debate of the whole, and it changed the whole debate when Dukakis messed up on it. Uh, the first question from Bernard Shaw. Yeah, you so, know. So you've been, you've been a moderator. The yeah. tension is so heavy. It is, but it, I was fascinated to hear, Andrea. And by the way, what a privilege it is to be with the three of you. It really Likewise. is a treat for me to I be here. I think this might be the first time all of us have been together on yeah, set possibly. at the same yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was just thinking back to 2019 when it was 20 candidates. I don't know Democratic how you did that. Presidency. We did two nights, remember right. that? Yeah. First night, 10 candidates. Right. The next night, 10 candidates. But those two weeks, were immersed in research and in finding out how to best ask questions that are important to the American people. And you know, Jose, that's when Kamala Harris really alienated a lot of people in the Biden camp, particularly the family, by going after him on the civil rights issue and saying, you know, that little girl was me. That was in Miami. Yeah, the busing issue. The that. busing and issue. And that was certainly something that uh, Kamala Harris prepared. Uh, I, and, you know, Chris, that's one of the preparations are, of course, the state chairs. How are they handling it? <laughs> so I feel sorry for the woman who was sitting next to me on Amtrak yesterday because I was on the phone the whole time <laughs> talking to four different... You were different... in the quiet car? I was in the quiet car, four separate uh, state chairs, three of them from battleground states, Michigan, Wisconsin, North Carolina, Florida. Fascinating the things that they largely agreed on. Number one, nobody thinks the stakes are being overstated here. Nobody thinks this is hyperbolic. Right. They understand from on the ground just how important this is. And from the door knocking, the people they're talking to who are out there doing that grassroots work, they're all being told that person after person after person is saying, I know Donald Trump. But I really want to know more about Kamala Harris, which means, right, opportunity, but also risk for her. Every moment is going to count. She has really got to figure out how to use her time there. And the other thing is they're struggling with how to find the truth. They're saying, I don't trust the ads. You know, it, I only got here last night. It was unbelievable how many ads are on oh local gosh. TV. But they They're want to know, can I trust what they say? And so the stakes, when we say they are high, the people behind those door knocks are saying they're incredibly high. And Anna, some of the people who are talking about voting and who they're targeting are college students. College students. I always love hearing from the voters because we, we look at the polls so often and try to get a pulse of the people when we do that. But when you talk to the voters and hear from them, you learn more about what they're thinking, how they're seeing the race, if they're excited, what's motivating them, what's influencing their vote in this election. And I spoke with these, these college students from Temple University, Latina voters, of course, the younger demographic, they're women, they're the Latino vote, all constituencies these candidates are targeting. And it was so interesting to hear the issues on their minds. They talked about their priorities being immigration, reproductive rights, Israel, Gaza, and uh, of course, climate change is another big one we haven't heard a lot about in this election cycle. Surprisingly, the economy wasn't top of mind for this group of students I spoke to, but they are plugged into this election and the issue specifically, they're going to be listening, they said, for substance, watching that 
part of the debate, not the style so much. That wasn't as important as the policy over personality. But I will say one of the reasons they're so engaged in this, device, this debate and perhaps some of the, the signs of the time is because of social media. And they mentioned the Charlie XCX tweet that came out after Kamala Harris was sort of put forward as the Democrat nominee. And, and they said that they, they feel the energy behind her in a real positive way and that they believe is engaging more of their generation in this election cycle. You know, and in fact, some of the people I've been seeing who really read the polls and try to figure out what is misleading and what is hype are saying that the initial burst of attention that Kamala Harris got was not so much pro Kamala Harris. It was among the Democratic base relief that Joe Biden had stepped aside and did so so gracefully and helped unify the party because there was so much concern about the age. And I was thinking about that, Anna, when you were just talking about the college kids, that there was really very little hope of Joe Biden getting a whole lot of support on college campuses. There's anger from both sides about what's going on in Gaza. So Democrats are divided. Plus, they are really looking at him, and they can't unwatch what they saw in that debate. Right. And so there was such a burst of relief among yeah. core Democrats. But now they've got to get those, the swing voters, the suburban women, the collars around, the collar communities around right. Philadelphia. You know, I, I just spoke uh, this week with two uh, ladies who just became U.S. citizens. One has been here for over 20 years. One has been here about 11 years. One from Colombia, one from Venezuela. And they're telling me, Andrea, the with the privilege of being U.S. citizens, the first thing they did was register to vote. And what they want from tonight's debate, Andrew, and I'm just thinking, how do you handle that from a moderator point of view? What they want is clarity, not only clarity of positions, but also respect of each other's ideas. How is that possible when you have, on the one side, someone, Donald Trump, who is specifically the opposite of respectful conversation and dialogue in a debate. Well, immigration is interesting because it's one of the places where we heard on a call that, that um, some of the folks on the Trump campaign did. They're going to continue to hit hard Kamala Harris. They believe that she has really not done the job at the border, and they blame her and Joe Biden for what they say is a rampant crime wave. It's interesting because people, again, who the door knockers are talking to, don't want to look back. They don't want the vitriol. They want to know positively what are you going to do to fix it. But I also wonder, Andrea, Joe Biden has gotten a lot more popular since he <laughs> stepped down. Sure. And, and does it help to attack him the way some of the surrogates in particular for Donald Trump have? And I wonder if he will tonight. I mean, there's a sympathy vote out there and there's respect. And a lot of this relief and respect by Democrats, certainly. Uh, maybe not so much from but Republicans. But maybe some of those swing voters. And he has an older constituency who appreciate yep. the fact he did not have to give up power. There was no way to, he had the nomination sewn up, you know, obviously with all of the, the, the primaries. So the pressure he was had, really he, intense. The pressure was intense, but he could have, I mean, it was a terrible three weeks. The c c congressional members were saying that it was just horrible for all of them. They were all torn apart. But the other thing I was thinking about when you talked about immigration, um, I'm checking the data on this because I'm going to call Homeland and get the facts. But I have known now of many long-term green card holders, and you know there are many in Washington, people who have been here 20, 30, 40 years without bothering to get citizenship, who are making appointments, going for their appointments, and getting citizenship. They want to vote. And I'm, you know, maybe this is not a slice. This is just anecdotal. I'm on the Amtrak corridor as you are, well. but people are stopping me, yeah. and they stop you, and they, you don't even. They don't even start by saying, "What's going to happen? What's going to happen? Who's going to win?" And they're they're watching, and they're they're much more high indeed. intensity voters Can than I give we've you a seen number, in the past. Real quick, three yeah. and a half million people of voting age have become U.S. citizens since the last presidential wow. election. I, would, I want to know how, much, how many in the last 75 days since she took over. Well, I, Jose, I just think and how people many that you've been talking to, these newly yes. uh, citizen, these nationalized citizens, how are they seeing the issue of immigration it's specifically? Not it's not black and white. I'm glad you mentioned that because a lot of them, and for example, one of the two ladies that I interviewed on camera said, listen, I feel for the people who have been here for decades, many, and who have yet to get their 
citizenship or their legality, but also concerned about the border. They're two different things.